Thanks very much for coming here. Uh, I'm told I should speak slowly, but what will happen is as I get into what I'm saying, I'll speed up. So slow me down, okay, if I start to get really uh, carried away. Uh, no stone unturned, if everyone knows what that means. Um, I, you know, I live here, I think most of you live in Rome, maybe not everyone is from Rome, but I think all of us were inspired by the city so that we're walking down that street, maybe we've gone down that street a hundred times, but then maybe, eh, I've got a couple of minutes to spare, I'll jump in that church, I'll take a look at that inscription over there, I'll peer into that museum. This is a city, I mean, there are very few cities like Rome, let's just be really honest. Um, very few, probably you can count them on one hand, uh, that are so historical, that, that have, have so much history that is uh, immediate, that is so easily, I think, engaging, that jumps out at us all the time if we take the time uh, to look. So I'm one of those people, I think, like pretty much uh, anyone living in this city that is always, to a degree, curious, is always, uh, to a degree, interested in learning a little bit more. Um, whatever circumstances, it's because you're taking your kid to uh, tennis lessons on the Flaminio, you're taking uh, another kid to catechismo at this church, and now you get to explore this church. I mean, there's always some opportunity, and so I don't really want to leave any stone unturned, although, as I do meet people, and they come to Rome on a visit, and they say, wow, this is amazing, I've been here three days, and I've seen everything, but I think I could come back, yeah, like a whole week. And some people, I could come back for a month. I mean, there's so much here in Rome to explore, and I'm thinking, and I say, like, look, I've lived here about 20 years, and I've had all kinds of amazing access and conversations, and talking with the superintendents here, working in the ministry and so forth, and I feel like I don't know anything, or I feel that I can go to these, um, you know, go to these places and I can learn something new. And I think, I think we could all take that idea wherever we live, and maybe to, and like me, an American coming over to Italy, I feel like sometimes it's a lot easier to do that in Italy because there's so much more immediate history that is available to us. But when I'm talking to students, and a lot of them are American, I'll say the, everyone has threads of history, has layers of history, and you need to tease them out. You can dig deeper in whatever your local community is. So part of it in my exploration, this living uh, in Rome as a perpetual tourist slash explorer. I don't know what I am, I can't. I mean, I live in Rome, I'm a Roman to a degree, but I have that easier energy to devote my time to, to learning more about the city, partially professionally, but then also partially, it's always, it always feels new. And maybe the harder thing, looking at my children growing up, is how they take things for granted because they are in a city like Rome. And then they go to Florida <laughs> or some place like that. And, and they don't want to take the time or they don't see that kind of connection which is so immediate in a city like Rome or in a country like Italy but it is definitely, I think, worth, uh, worth the effort. So just to, I wanna explore a few areas that you probably all know. Some of you in the audience, oh my God, are art historians and archeologists and so forth. So some of you know these areas real well. Maybe some of you have you know, driven by a million times, have you taken the time to stop and look. So this is the Arco di Giano, this Arch of Janus, which is currently being um, restored by World Monuments Fund. So one common thread, one thing that's always 
piqued my interest is who's taking care of this? Who's financing this? How is this part of a local community? These are all kinds of questions that not, it's not really the archeologist hat, it's more like the, the conservation hat. How are we preserving all this history which is becoming much more relevant in our conversations when we go to archeological sites and we're saying who can maintain all of this? Uh, even in the center, I mean, there are, there are big issues. So Arcogiano, Arcogiano, fourth century arch, has uh, a spectacular site uh, within the uh, urban fabric of the Forum Boarium. So the Forum Boarium is tied to mythology and Aeneas and the pre-story of Rome. So long before Romulus and Remus, this area is key. So when I'm going through the city, I'm going through things in multiple layers. How are these things tying into story, oral tradition, uh, mythology, beyond just the archaeology and the architecture? Uh, because this is, you know, this is a town where, where history happened. We're in the cattle market where Hercules came with his cattle, according to the stories uh, recorded in, uh, in Virgil's Aeneid. And next to it, there is this other arch, uh, another arch of the Forum Boarium, which is the Arch of the Argentarii, which has a fence around it, but if you stick your phone through the fencing, you can see some incredible details. So what is this city to us today, maybe on a tourist route, what is this city to us when we look at uh, early third century AD, here's Septimia Severus and his wife, Julia Domna. What a multi, when I look at this, I think, how much of multiculturalism was present in ancient Rome when we're living in, of course, very multicultural uh, existence right here in this big capital city, at least in terms of all the tourists that are coming here. Maybe it's not a New York in that sense of a melting pot. Uh, but, you know, think about how multicultural the existence is today. How was it in antiquity? Here's an emperor from, from North Africa, from Libya. His wife is from Syria. And then, right there, one of their two sons, that's Geta. You can't see him because he's been famously erased and mommy's arm has been recarved. Big brother, Caracalla, he's opposite. And he is the one who ultimately has that existence of his little brother erased. Anyone, anyone a little brother or a little sister? Okay, I'm a little brother, so I feel, I feel for Gator. I, oh. And uh, I don't know if my parents had divided the Roman Empire between me and my brother. I think he probably would have had me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably what would have happened. Um, so all of these different realities, takeaways, um, I mean, it's these, these, some one uh, author called these things the mute stones, and he wrote a book called The Mute Stones Speak. And maybe this speaks a lot more because we have figures, we have a lot more uh, details, but I think all of these monuments will quickly go through, can tell us stories and keep us, I mean, do many things. It can ask us uh, about ourselves, it can take us into, I wanna learn more, or what's the connectivity between this and the larger picture of Rome. So I think it's just an incredible starting point for a whole series of conversations as we go through the city. We're in the cattle market, so of course, ultimately, you have um, cattle being uh, sacrificed. Okay, and then in the distance, of course, maybe something a little more familiar, and we're eventually gonna get ourselves over to the Tiber River and Tiber Island. But there you have the round temple uh, of one of the many of, of Hercules, and I swear, I, I, I I, I grind my teeth if somebody tells me it's the Temple of Vesta. But uh, it's, uh, don't do that. And then we have the Temple of Portunus, and Portunus is the god of the port because this is one of the earliest places along the Tiber where the ships would dock. It was a place, an easy place to moor your ship because the force of the Tiber River was divided by the island that we're gonna get ourselves to. But here's something just in the bushes across the street from this. So across from the street, there's 47 hotel, and then there's some bushes. And what's in the bushes? 
Anyone ever notice this? Anybody? Bueller? Okay. So, um, so this is basically found just a little bit. It's been placed now on, you can tell this is modern brickwork. It's on a modern a little platform. Obviously, there was care given to it, attention given to it at, at the time, and this is in the fascist era when it was unearthed. It's a little higher up than the ancient Roman levels, but if we take a close look at it, we can rake out some letters. So if you like, and there's a whole other world, right, that opens up to you. Um, you're Italian, so it's easy. You can all get Latin pretty well when you look at the inscriptions. Probably half of you did Liceo Classico. How many did Liceo Classico? All right, all right. So totally worthless, right? Not, not, yeah. My older daughter, she's in Liceo Classico, but she's doing a special section, which is French and Latin and, Italian and Spanish and all this stuff. But she says, I don't want to do a Liceo Classico exactly because what's the point? So you can see how. Is it big issues here. I said, yeah, but the, these are the things that everyone, this is, the, this is the anchor. I mean, think about philosophy and Latin and Greek. There's a reason why people did this in the past and why we should really consider today why we should still do this. What are the validities of this? That also ties into some of these uh, threads here. Um, so I'm, I'm still a big advocate of um, Liceo Classico, although to a degree I've lost part of the battle with with my kids, but they have to go in their own direction as well. Um, so we have a couple of letters, ord. So if, you, if you've looked at inscriptions, they're all like this, right? You're almost never in perfect shape. So because you have an O, R, and a D, og and sacrum, so this is a little sacred um, altar dedicated to, we think, the Concordia of Augustus. And, and how many people stop by and look at this. There's a statue base behind it. But the point is that unless we really, really dig deeper, we're going to be left with fewer and more isolated monuments. So today, these other things, right, they're isolated because of the destruction that took place to make the road in the fascist era, deconsecrated churches, and so forth. You know, a lot of the fabric, and where I was talking, had a great talk with you about what's in the periphery of Rome. How do we get people to go to experience that? Well, the first thing starts with what's the local community? Maybe it's harder in the center for local communities because we're so inundated with Airbnbs and McDonald's and whatever. It's hard. I mean, but we do have neighborhoods. There, you know, I live right by Campo di Fiori, and I still have the tailor and the butcher and the uh, barber shop and the whatever. I mean, it's all the local community is there. But you know, if the local community has a buy-in to the little things, these things will have a, will resonate more. They'll have more of a presence. There'll be signage. There'll be you know participation. There'll be more preservation, and it won't just be focused on the big and the obvious. That's uh, that that's a part of which I always think about. How can we not lose the little nooks and crannies and little things which aren't the mega stars, but are things that you know, are part of the big picture still. Okay, over into, rooting over to the river, slowly but surely. Um, we have a lovely, recently restored Portico da Tavia of the third century AD. And if you do peer in, uh, going into the archeological site, you have a nice clean inscription, but you also have some examples of reuse. So one of the great things I love, even though I'm specialized in, let's say, late Republic, early Imperial, Julio-Claudians and the Flavians and so forth, I love looking, maybe the most, it's so much fun to talk about and consider and figure out why this stuff is still here or how it got to us in the shape in which we see it. So I don't like teaching my students about these monuments in isolation when they were built and that's it. It's what happened in the 1870s, what happened under Mussolini, what happened in the 1980s, uh, even that restoration of the Arch of Janus taking place now in 2018. So here you see reused columns stuck in the fabric of the entrance of the Portico da Tavia. So recycling. And when I think of recycling, I think of 
what are we talking about cities today? Resilient cities, recycling, sustainability. And I, and I think about how, how do we get something, from, what can we learn from the Romans? How do we have, how do we create sustainable cities today? Can we not have good conversations, productive conversations, as we look at what the Romans themselves were doing? Reconstructing the Porta Catavia, in this case, the second time, but it's really the third portico in the situation if we consider the porticus of Metelli. And someone's nodding their head, yeah. Love that portico. And again, a beautiful restoration job that took forever, but done. Okay, jumping over to Tiber Island, um, which is spectacular. And, and actually, I, was, I went down below and I'll show you some of the details. And also my parents, who are following one of my live streams said, We've been here all these years and we've never gone down below. How many people have gone down below and walked right here? Besides for sunbathing. <laughs> Not just to do this. Okay, you go right there, take off your shirt, okay. Okay, so this is a, this is a great place that you have an enormous area to yourself if you want. But, and, uh, you know, there are the little stands here with the food and yada yada, I'm not a, I'm not a fan, but, um, you know, other than that, just go down today, and what will you see? So Tiber Island, then Bartholomew, you have a church. There once was the Temple of Asclepius. Where's the temple? We don't have much archaeology. A little bit inside the, uh, inside the portico there. And of course, it's a place of healing. Uh, we're just a stone's throw away from uh, the synagogue. And this is one of the two bridges that connects so in terms of connectivity, in terms of linking us to the past, what better way than to be able to walk across the bridge that's over 2,000 years old, 62 BC, still with the inscription. We don't have to reconstruct this in our minds. We don't have to, 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 to imagine what it looked like. We don't have to guess at who made it. I mean, this is, this is incredible. Uh, and of course, for every picture here, or every time you walk by, think of how everything is different. What's the height of the water? Do you guys remember 2008 when the water was up to here? Should have put a photo in there. I mean, just everything is, is different depending on the light, the time of day, are the, are the leaves here or not, and so forth. So every time it can be a different experience. Every time it is a different experience. And, uh, and on the other side, you have the Pons Cestius which is much more, say, worse for wear, but you know, totally reconstructed with, the, dismantled, reconstructed with the construction of the flood walls. Um, still historic, of course, but didn't have the same grab. I mean, I have different emotional feelings when I go over the two bridges going, eh, too bad, could have been. You know, I don't know how, how, how these stones speak to you, um, but there's always something more I think, to tease out from them as we walk around and, and, and look at them from different perspectives. Then we come down to the actual piazza where you have the um, festival of the cinema down below here in the, in the summer. Otherwise, do you go there? You know, why would you go there? Um, and you, you just have a huge space to yourselves. I mean, Rome is very crowded, but here you can be on any given morning all by yourself. Uh, with the two uh, bridges, the synagogue, in the backside of the, um, of the Tiber Island. And, uh, and then we say right behind, oh, not so good with the light, but this is the Ponte Rotto. How many people have walked over Ponte Rotto? Okay, you can't do that. Uh, there was one idea to put a little bridge from the Ponte Palatino, nice idea. Um, but essentially, it's an isolation, but this is probably the best point from which you can admire it. And again, with three bridges right there, you get another sense of what Rome was like in antiquity, because you know, all the bridges pretty much broke all the way up into Castel Sant'Angelo. We had that one, then we had the, the two at the Tiber Island, and that's it. Everything else broke through the Middle Ages. But to, to be standing in this spot and seeing three of them all together, I think you get, again, a different kind of sense of what the activity was, what the life was, the connectivity also to Trastevere, what was Trastevere like? And this, I think, leaves you hungry for more, because if you go to Trastevere today, 
there isn't so much archaeology that's very obvious, even though, of course, it was uh, you know, part of Rome and a, and, a, and a very big part of Rome, very international part of Rome. There are 12 synagogues in Trastevere, so very multicultural, um, um, different religions, different ideas, and the exchange right, was over these bridges. Okay, so we get some uh, views here then of this massive piazza, which is further ac accentuating this idea that this is uh, an island almost in the shape of a boat. But from antiquity, if you get a little closer to this little section right here, if you take the time to walk over to it, you say, oh, that is like a boat as well. And this is a little piece. I mean, what I'm hungry for too is how to go back into the past in the different moments of time. And it's hard because we have great things in the sixth century BC. We have so much of the imperial in antiquity. But what do we have in the middle? What do we have for the Republic? Very, very few things, like Largo Argentina and Santa Babono. I mean, what do you show your students? How do you, how do you connect all the literature and the Ciceros and, 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 and all the Scipios and all this great, these historical figures? It's really hard. Here's one of these places where you can make a connection. One of the few artifacts in situ with Asclepius himself with his little uh, wand here. So that, that, there's so many times if we take the time to explore something that we think we already know, we can turn up, we can connect. I mean, it's not making, you haven't made a discovery that's changed the world, but what does it mean then to you if you see the connection between Tiber Island, Temple of Asclepius of Healing, and then your child was delivered in Fate Bene Fratelli? Didn't happen to my kids. We, we worked on that, but it didn't happen. But it's a nice thing to do to have your children born on Tiber Island, I think, uh, if it works out. There's a connectivity, then a place of healing for you know, over 2,200 years. Ideas that uh, went beyond pagan ideas into, into you know, Christianity. A place to moor, uh, um, maybe a ship here is the head of a bull. Okay, jumping over, a couple more little vignettes just uh, to consider. Here's the Pyramide di Cestius. Has anyone ever, has anyone seen this before? Yeah, okay. Has anyone been inside it? Okay, you can, you can go inside it, open on weekends. And one of the neat things is you get different perspectives. This is from the uh, Porta San Paolo uh, or the uh, Porta Ostiense. You can go up there for free. Make sure you go up to the top terrace. It's a nice, fun place. And you can get the same pyramid that you walk by or drive by every day, but from a different perspective, you get a better sense of how it was connected to the, the fabric of the uh, Aurelian Wall. And this spot, when you walk right by it, doesn't look like much, but this is the entry point for the tomb raiders that robbed the central um, tomb area where the goods were stored. And uh, good old tunnel through the cement to get to the central uh, space. Um, and you can see, obviously, that the monument itself was uh, to the base buried uh, as the ground level came up. But you go through this doorway today, and it's a doorway then placed in by the popes. So in the papal period, they wanted to get access to the central room. They had to make their own uh, doorway to give everyone that simple access. You just go down a little corridor, kind of stoop down a little bit, and you have some nice um, third style wall paintings. This is contemporary with, uh, uh, and this is Age of Augustus. Uh, so not so much inside per se, but um, I mean the the experience of, ex of of exploring. I think even if the end result today is ah, where's the sarcophagus, where's the gold, where's the it's gone, but you have a way of of tapping into different life experiences, the tomb raiders, uh, uh, the papal restorers, recent conservation work, and it can, I think, drive a lot of interest into, again, how is it that this is still here? And then ultimately, you know, contemplate your own mortality because you're in the tomb of Cestius. What am I leaving behind? What am I leaving to my kids? What am I, what contribution did I make? Okay, let's see here. Okay, hold on. 
Okay, okay, okay. Okay, quickly into the changing gears a little bit. Has anyone, everyone been inside the Pantheon? Okay, remember, hurry up, because I think by May 22nd, or May 2nd, it's gonna cost you three bucks. I think locals won't pay, but expect a line, which is just gonna get worse. Not happy about that. Okay, anyways, inside, got marble. This section is the one little area that restores part of what they think the original interior decoration would have looked like. We can look at the floor. Marvelous floors, mostly uh, intact, mostly authentic. But where's, and, and, this is, and so this is second century AD. By the fourth century AD, this is instead in Ostiantica, House of Cupid and Psyche, you're getting marble being reused, and we're calling this opus sectile. And uh, what an, a glorious example of creating new geometric patterns with reused marble. So there's a lot of recycling. I've already touched upon this before with the uh, portico at Octavia. How much is being reused? How much is being repurposed? How much is being recycled? And then how is it connecting to what we're doing today? We want to have a sustainable future. Um, the Romans, they had it in their past. Here's a tomb of the, uh, the uh, Villa of the Quintilii, Frigidarium. On the Appia, where we will be digging, the American Institute for Roman Culture is digging this summer with the uh, superintendency. And you see bits and pieces, again, of Opus Seculae, second and third centuries AD, but a lot of it, it's down to the preparatory level. It's been robbed, it's been removed, and it's been, you could say, stolen, you could say repurposed, you could say uh, recycled. Here's an example of still in place the bronze pin, one of many that would have held together the materials. Where does it end up? So we jump to say the 10th century, by the 12th century they're calling it uh, Cosmatesque floors, the Cosmati brothers, but already existing in the 10th century. This is San Benedetto in Piscinulla in Trastevere, and you're getting an idea of this is what happens. This is another market, this is a new industry. Think about how what's happening today in jobs, and jobs are getting recycled, and jobs are, there's downturn of this, there's an uptick in this. Here's a new job, here's a huge industry, and a new original construction is coming from something that was old, something that otherwise was just being burnt down for lime. Something that was just considered to be building material is taking on new life in churches, new purpose, original designs, and so forth. So how do we repurpose things? How do people repurpose things in the past? Um, this is in Chile, uh, Santa Cecilia in uh, Tercevere. And if you've ever walked right in the entrance and looked to the right, here is one of the boundary stones of Rome. So think about, again, what's the center? What's the periphery? What's the relationship? How are we dialoguing one with another? Rome in antiquity was always pushing its boundaries and extending the pomerium. We're always talking about defining boundaries, baking boundaries, going beyond. The Romans had their own way in which they do this, and then, lucky for us, immortalize, stuck in a wall. So I think that, again, we have many, many opportunities, with a little bit of knowledge of Latin in this case, but a way to stay curious about the past what does this one little element here fit in with the bigger picture? Where do I fit in within that story? These are the kinds of questions um, I think we can perpetually ask. Looking over in the Foro Romano to conclude, it's like one minute, and um, obviously you know the Foro Romano. Has ever, who's, have you been in the Foro Romano? Okay. No? Did somebody say no? Oh my God, okay, so, so you have to go, you have to go, okay? This is a good time of year to go. Anyways, last thing is Foro Romano, Everything is being reused in the Foro Romano. And there are layers upon layers of history, but the excavators, principally Giacomo Boni, they take it down to the Augustan level. So there are many other Romes. Some people say the layers of Rome are like reading a book. Uh, peeling an onion. I say peeling an onion sometimes. Some people say it's like Swiss cheese. So think about the different ways in which we connect to the past and how we view the past and how we even experience the past. We can see whole layers in, in buildings like the tabularium. Some things we read about, we've seen photographs, but it's missing. So we fill in the gaps. 
what's still there, what was there, what's documented, what we heard about, what was in the drawing by Piranesi, what's in these, uh, you know, Dipperax uh, drawings. Many, many, many things we can fill in. Of course, and new technology can help fill in virtually these things uh, if you're into that sort of thing. But looking over here at the Temple of Saturn, it's got scaffolding up on it right now, which is great. Some restoration work, get rid of that ivy or edra, very bad. So it just depends on how you want to look at these things. But what we have in common between this and this is that these are some of the last buildings reconfigured and reconstructed in the Roman Forum all the way to 363 AD, AD, Dopo Cristo. So really, really old, really, really old. We're at the end of the story of the Forum per se as this monumental uh, entity, and it's because people are still reclaiming that past preserving that past, wanting to have um, a, 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 a buy-in uh, of that past in the great ancient pagan gods like Saturn, even though you have the, already had the legalization of Christianity. Um, and this last image then leaving you with, um, the portico right here is, is uh, reconstructed in 367, and then ultimately, as you can tell, retrofitted, re-erected anastolosis, another form of storytelling. So depends on how you want, what goggles, what goggles or glasses you want to put on um, when you do explore the past. Do you want to take it for what it is at face value? Do you want to peel back the layers and understand what the archaeologists did and the architects that are involved to reconstruct it to give us a better picture? Do we want to just take it in terms of this kind of great, um, kind of glorious, uh, defunct empire? signs of decline and fall. These are the ways, I think, in which we can really renew an interest in the past, making connections then to today with materials, ideas, and these bigger pictures of how we're gonna actually preserve the now. Can we not take inspiration from these sorts of experiences, walks, and from looking at the architecture, looking at the ideas of the people uh, that produced them. I mean, they did quite well, if you, if you will, for thousands of years. And now let's see what we can do for the next, the next millennium. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie davvero. Um, prima di passarvi la parola per qualche domanda, Volevo solo fare una riflessione per cui voglio ringraziare Darius perché ehm, ci ha fatto capire, eh, qualora ce ne, ce ne fosse bisogno, ma ce n'è bisogno secondo me in questa fase storica, come senza guardare al nostro passato non possiamo guardare al nostro futuro e questo è per me una, una cosa fondamentale. E, ok, banale, mica tanto, perché, perché proprio in questa fase storica è una cosa molto importante. E, e l'altra cosa che trovo per noi eh, importante da sottolineare come proprio Creative Mornings è quanta ispirazione abbiamo intorno al nostro ambiente che frequentiamo tutti i giorni e quanta non ne vediamo ma uh, così fermandoci qualche volta magari possiamo, possiamo ispirarci davvero più che quotidianamente e allargare un po' la nostra mente. Questo è quello che cerchiamo di fare così, con le nostre piccole cose. Grazie. Grazie.